Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Illustration Department Podcast. I am your host, Giuseppe Castellano. In this podcast, I talk to folks in illustration, animation, and other creative fields about their beginnings, their successes, and the bumps and bruises they've experienced along the way. In this episode, I talk to illustrator and art director Kayla Wassel. It's a special treat to interview Kayla because in 2013, I hired her out of college as a design assistant. Among other topics, we talk about what it was like working together at Penguin. She shares insights into the ups and downs of art directing a children's book. And she answers questions from you about postcards, portfolios, getting work, trends, and the mistakes she sees illustrators make. I hope you enjoy our conversation. I feel like, I don't know, if like five years ago or a little while longer than that, if you had told me that you and I would be recording a podcast together and that you would be working at Simon & Schuster, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't believe it. I honestly wouldn't believe it. When did I, when did we first meet? I met you at Micah. What year was that? Uh, <laughs> uh, probably 2013, right? Yeah, senior year. Your senior year. Yeah. Because it was right before I graduated. Yeah. It was actually perfect timing because I was looking for a design assistant. I think you wanted an intern first and I couldn't do it because I had already accepted a job. So you hired Betsy, which was great for Betsy. <laughs> but then I hired you as an, as a junior designer or a design assistant Uh, as as an assistant i just looked out with the timing honestly better for me to be hired as an assistant than than an intern right yeah and i was at micah on the invitation of daniel what was his last name crawl crawl Mm -hmm. and doing portfolio reviews for seniors and was it a pizza break or something like we were eating pizza i remember that it was definitely a pizza break. <laughs> it was a pizza break. It was like, um, what's her name? Seesmeyer. Oh, Callie. Yeah. Like we were eating pizza. I remember Callie Seesmeyer. I think Seesmeyer. Seesmeyer was there. Um, some other folks. And I don't know how we met. I don't know if you just like walked up to me or if someone introduced us. I think Dan introduced us because I was his studio assistant at the time. And I think he was sort of like, come over here and meet this person. They're looking for an intern. Um, I think, or at least that's like the gist of what I remember him saying. Mm -hmm. And I think I might've had like a slice of pizza in my hand. And, uh, and I don't remember saying anything along the lines of like, Hey, I'm looking for an intern or did I, I don't think I did. I don't remember what you said. I remember Dan saying that. Right. I feel like we just said hi. And then maybe there were emails later. Yeah. So we said hi. And I went back to, I went back home. I went back to work at Penguin. And I told HR, I'm like, I think I found the person I want to hire. And you would, it was like just right at graduation. So you, the next time we spoke was over the phone. Mm Mm-hmm. And you were at home in Pittsburgh. Yes. And I don't think I've ever told you this. So I went, <laughs> so I went after Micah, I went home, I went back to Penguin. Uh, I said to HR, not that this is the person I think I want to hire. I just said, this is the person I want to hire. Was that, can I ask, was that based off of just like the hello, just and, off the hello interaction? Yeah. And your website. Oh, okay. And your work. And Dan saying how great you were and organized and um, yeah, he just spoke very highly of you and your work spoke very highly of you. I mean, you had just, just based on your illustration work. Cause I really, I don't think there really is, was any design work. There were there. maybe like two or three pieces. Cause I had taken a design class. So there was a little bit of stuff in yeah. there, but I could tell like you just, you were really talented and Anyway, so I said to HR, I, I want to hire this person. HR being HR, they were like, well, let's set up an interview. And I'm just like, no, no, no. Just call her and tell her she's hired. <laughs> They're like, no, let's set up an interview and uh, it'll be a phone call between you and her. And I was like, fine. 
And so we get on the we get on the phone. So they tell you to call me, and it's like call him at one o'clock p.m., which you mm-hmm. do. And I remember saying to you something along the lines of, "Oh, we're I'm only talking to you to make sure that you're not a robot." <laughs> I don't remember that. <laughs> I inside I wanted to say, "Look, kid, I'm hiring you, but <laughs> HR is making me do this." Oh, that's so funny. It was such a weird conversation because I just was like, I'm trying, I'm interviewing you. I'm interviewing someone who I know I'm going to hire. And so it was just sort of like, so tell me about what's up. Oh, you're back at home from school. What are you doing? Man, I barely remember it, um, to be honest. I'm sure I was super nervous. I did not know that you were, you had already decided you wanted to hire me. Because then I feel like I waited for a really long time between the interview and HR actually telling me I was hired. Like, I feel like it was almost a month, unless I'm misremembering that. Possibly. Do you remember why? No, I really don't know. Because I remember, like, I had already found an apartment in New York, and I was like, well, I'm moving, whether or not I have this job. (laughs) Um, And it was, like, getting closer and closer to move date, and I was like, I still don't know if I have a job. Um, And then it did work out, but, like, I already had the apartment lined up by the time I got the call from HR that was like, yeah, you're hired. I was like, great, good. I can like actually move in and then immediately start working. Yep. And that was the summer of 2013. Yep. And we worked together for four years. Mm -hmm. And over those four years, I mean, you went from design assistant through to assistant art director. I think I was senior designer when you left. And then assistant art director was after that. Yep. I tell you what, man, it was like pulling teeth to get you promoted. (laughs) I'm so glad you did it. (laughs) (laughs) I don't think I realized until after you had left how um, much of a struggle it seemed to be to get promotions to go through. Oh my God. And the reason I, like I promoted you a few times from from design assistant to senior designer within the four years which is mm-hmm. kind of unheard of at Penguin because they have this weird rule of like you can't promote anyone within uh, unless they've worked there for two years. I was not aware at all that this was a difficult process because I just kept getting, <laughs> um, I just kept getting promotions like every year. <laughs> well, because because I could, I just kept saying to like uh, folks in charge, let's just say, let's just call them. Uh, I'm like, if we don't promote her, she's leaving. And I, that can't happen. You walked in as design assistant. That was your title. I, within, within the year, definitely, but probably within like six months, you were already doing junior designer slash designer level work already within the, and I was even like, man, slow down a little bit, kid. Cause <laughs> Damn it. Like, <laughs> I'm going to have to fight HR to promote you sooner rather than later, um, which I was happy to do. But then, yeah, so then it was like you just accelerated. The learning curve for you wasn't really that great. And so you just stepped in. You did what you needed to do. You were wonderful at it, which is why every year during your review time, I just, was, I just told you what my boss at Simon & Schuster told me. You're great. No. And that was that. And I'm like, all right, so now you can go back to work. Like we don't have to, (laughs) you you did a bunch of different kinds of, like you did board books, you work, you did, um, the, uh, publishing branding for girls who code, you worked on the Steven universe, uh, guide to, um, what was the title of that? There was the answer. There was a guide to the crystal gems. I think I actually did every single Steven Universe book that Penguin published, except for one. You gave me a break one season because I had had a meltdown over them the season before. (laughs) Just because there was so much work and so many cooks in the kitchen, that sort of thing? Uh, Yeah. Those books I loved so deeply also that like... I was really putting like 120% into all of them all the time. So then when there were a lot of, um, a lot of cooks in the kitchen and like a lot of pressure to like make them really good, it, that's like one of the few projects that I remember like actually really upsetting me because I was so invested in it. Um, and that it was like the specific project and not really like an incident. 
But I mean, I, I love all those books and I'm very proud of having worked on all of them. And it was not any one particular thing mm-hmm. that um, sort of caused that. But it was, it was nice afterwards to get a break because especially with the licensed stuff, sometimes you're so immersed in that world, like constantly, especially when you're doing like, I don't know, probably like three books a season. So like nine books a year, all mm-hmm. based around the same property. It was nice to have a little break in there. What other licensed properties did you work on? So I did Octonauts. I did like the Peter Rabbit 3D show. I did The Hive briefly. Oh my God, The Hive. <laughs> yeah, those those giant bees. <laughs> oh my goodness. Were those the giant bees with like the detached arms and legs? Yes, that yeah. was those ones. <laughs> Always buy I have no that. idea if that show is still on. Well, for people who are listening and going like licensed properties, what what's going on? So there were, I mean, for Peng- Penguin in our group, we did what two hundred plus books a year, more or less. Let's say one seventy five to two hundred books a year, and about a third were licensed properties, mostly Cartoon Network. Basically, it's like you you create a book based on a show, so it's a book product based on some other form of media. Those were challenging. I always used to love working on them because they did present the designer with a lot of rules and walls in which to work. And you had to find the creativity within that space. Do you feel the same way or did you, were you just sort of like, ah, uh, these are, these are the ones we have to do in addition to the ones that I, that I actually want to do? No, I actually really liked working on them. I mean, one of the, the things I liked at Penguin, and like generally, I mean, this is still true at my current position, is like getting to do a mix of both is really, really nice because I I do like working within the parameters of a license. And we did so many cool ones, especially when we were doing all the Cartoon Network stuff, um, where just people who worked on the original property. So like the folks at Cartoon Network had put so much thought into like what they wanted the world to feel like what they wanted the textures and fonts and patterns to look like. Um, and then to sort of take those and reinterpret them into a book sometimes can be really frustrating, um, depending on what you're working with. And sometimes can be like super fun because suddenly you have made an object that just like fits right into this world. Um, and that's super satisfying to, and I, again, I think especially with Cartoon Network, this was easy to do, but it was really satisfying to make books that looked like they were part of mm-hmm. those universes. Yep. And for me, as a kid and as a dad of kids, um, licensed character books were the gateways to reading. Um, I was a very reluctant reader when I was a kid, but I can remember all the Transformers books that I read back in the eighties and my son was a reluctant reader and his first books were those like Marvel readers Mm -hmm. and he got into reading that way. And then he transitioned out from that to, you know, the captain underpants of the world, like those kinds of books. Mm -hmm. And he, now he's, he's been reading ever since. I was trying to explain what, what licensed books were recently to a friend I don't know the way that they were like, oh, it's like books adapted from movies that they like kids are already watching these shows and then parents just put the books from the shows in front of their kids. I was like, yeah, yeah, but also like kids who maybe are a little like not very confident reading, Mm -hmm. recognize the characters and the stories and the worlds. And it's like maybe and sometimes even the story, which like if it's based on an episode that makes it even easier for someone who's just learning how to read because it's like, oh, you kind of already know the story beats because you've watched the episode. So now you're like reading the words that go with it. Yeah. So why did you have to fight your parents to go to art school? (laughs) They just like really, I think they were mostly scared that I wouldn't be able to get a job afterwards, that it would be like, you know, a a waste of money and time and I'd be unemployed. Um, But I, I had to fight them like tooth and nail to go to art school. And you obviously won and you eventually went to Micah. Yeah. And that's actually, um, I, I can't remember if we've ever talked about this, actually. My freshman year of college, I actually went to Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, and then I transferred to MICA my sophomore year and finished my degree at MICA. But part of the reason I went to VCU freshman year was because my parents really wanted me to be at a liberal arts school with a good art program as opposed to just an art school, I think, because they were half hoping that I would change my mind um, (laughs) and do something um, that wasn't art. 
but I didn't. And in fact, I got more adamant that I only do art and transferred to just an art school. <laughs> nice. Um, I felt a little bit of that while you and I were working together. I felt like when you were determined to go in one design direction <laughs> or another, um, <laughs> I, you know, I, it, and I was, and it was like a direction that I didn't uh, think was the right one. You dug in more than the other designers did, but you didn't do really? it in like, yeah, but you weren't like petulant about it or anything. You were just like, no, this is why, I, this is how I want to do this. You know, the process at Penguin was, um, for folks listening, was like the designer, you guys would put together the, the designs of the, you know, cover of the interior. You would route it to me. I would look through it and just make sure that, you know, quality control, but also just to make sure that things were in the right place. And I also had a lot of fun just having a front row seat to your <laughs> design solutions and, and your teammates. Anyway, so I would review them and I remember your designs, particularly with, with like your chapter books, you would never leave enough room in the margin for the like margins. You would always have like really, really thin margins. <laughs> and it was a common note. I was like, you know, Kayla, you have to make your margins a little bigger for this kind of book. And I remember making that same note for several years before you finally like locked in. And yeah. the same goes with letting you, your letting would always be really tight. And I don't know if it still is the, <laughs> this way. I don't know if the folks at Simon & Schuster are like, what's up with your tight letting? Um, but I remember having to tell you that like, just loosen your letting up a little bit. And it, was a, it wasn't a one-time comment. It was a repeated comment. So I, you know, it's like you, once you set yourself to wanting to do something, you, you do it and it takes a little, a little bit of effort to kind of get you going in a different direction. I remember the letting comment and I do think I got better about it just because I had to be aware that like my natural tendency was to make things squashed, honestly, yeah. on interiors. Mm -hmm. But I remember one of the first times I did it, I think this was Cat Sinclair, which was like the first chapter book that I ever laid out a whole interior for on my own. Um, I think you said, I'd love to see you pack a suitcase in reference to how <laughs> much stuff I had put in how small of a space. Yep. When you first started working at Penguin, did you think, you're, like, what was the one thing that surprised you the most about working in a publishing company? This isn't like a specific thing. This is sort of a, a more, uh, this might be more related to like just working at a large company in general. I had a really hard time adjusting to everyone gets a say in what I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I told people that it was like working on the worst group project ever. And I was just like, um it was really hard for me to get used to six people leaving me comments that I had to follow. It wasn't like a suggestion like it is in school when you're sort of making your own thing. And the goal when you're making your own illustrations or when you're making work in school, the goal is just to make a cool thing that you're excited about and your teacher's excited about. When you're doing illustration or design work, for something that is going to be sold, suddenly all these other factors are introduced, like um, not only like is it good work, but also like it has to fulfill X, Y, Z requirements. You have to fit this much text on it. There has to be like someone's going to add a burst at the last minute. Oh, yeah, Sales yeah. won't sell a yellow cover. Like all these like weird, um, mm -hmm. sometimes useful, sometimes really distracting notes come into play that like you have to enact. And that's not even taking into account like the editor's opinion, the author's opinion, your art director's opinion. It was really frustrating for me to realize that like the shift in the way that the art I was making was going from just like things that are the most beautiful they can be to like things that are serving a very specific purpose, mm -hmm. which is to communicate things about the book, and to sell the book. Mm -hmm. Specifically with publishing, a lot of designers, that's like one of the last things they finally, what, well, you know what, let me, I'll just speak for myself. That was one of the last things I had to finally learn before like taking like my significant steps into my publishing career was, you know, folks like I had gone to one of the best art schools around and now there's this person who, didn't hasn't taken an art class in their life saying telling me that something needs to change art wise and as a very young designer that would piss me off uh, it made like, me crazy oh it gosh. still makes me crazy kind of but i have had to let it go <laughs> <laughs> 
yeah, you know, it's like, well, can, this has to, you know, move this here and make change this color to this. And you're, and you're like, I took like five classes that specifically explain why what you just said is wrong. <laughs> Did I, hmm, let me think if I could tell this story without hmm, getting myself in trouble. Well, okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm definitely the villain in this story. Cause I was, I was being spicy in a meeting. Um, <laughs> I, I was having a disagreement with someone in a meeting of who they were not a designer. This was not a meeting specifically about design, but something about, um, book cover art style came up and they said that they didn't like a particular art style on, I don't know, some book that was like on the bestseller list or something. It wasn't even one of our books. They said they didn't like the art style. And I was like, no, I think it's cute. And then they said, I don't know, something dumb about why they didn't like it. And I I said, which one of us has an art degree Um, to a person who I really should not have said that to. Oh, boy. And um, it... I didn't get in trouble. Everyone laughed, but it's kind of a miracle that I didn't get in trouble for that. Was I there? Because that I don't oh, remember that. No. no, no, no. This was like last year. Okay, you can't see yeah, me, yeah. but I'm smiling like a huge smile because that's yeah. that's incredible. That's a, such a zinger. And well, I probably shouldn't have done it. People listening, don't do that. Don't don't, don't be that no. spicy in meetings. Definitely not. I got away with it because I was I somehow managed to spin it as funny and charming. Um, but I did immediately feel kind of terrible. There was, there was not really a need for me to do that. I I have a feeling if you were like a design assistant and you were just hired three weeks ago, you probably wouldn't have, you you probably would have gotten into, into a little hot water. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I I mean, honestly, I probably deserve to get into hot water for saying that in my mind at the time I was defending an illustration style that I did genuinely like a lot. Mm -hmm. And I feel like is very popular. Like it was a wheelhouse of illustration that is popular right now. And I had like, I fully intended and continue to intend to hire illustrators whose work looks like that. So I didn't want to set a precedent for like, haha, we're going to like laugh at this style and say that it's like weird or too cartoony or whatever was being said. I don't even remember. Um, I don't know. There's better ways to do that. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to tell you a story. Okay. (laughs) An ex publisher of little Simon Mm-hmm. And Simon Spotlight. Mm-hmm. She was the publisher when I started at Simon and Schuster, and I was a design assistant. And she made—I don't remember the book, and I don't remember the note, but I do remember my reaction, and I do remember the consequence. So she had made a note. It was pretty much the same kind of process at, at SNS back then. You know, the de- it started the design starts with obviously the designer. It then routes around to like my boss the the executive art director at the time was honey yammer and Mm -hmm. then to the editor and then to the editor's boss and then to the publisher and then back to the designer and just like you said now there's five or six opinions you have to follow especially as a design assistant so anyways um and i didn't know not to do this Uh i just i just got up out of my seat (laughs) And I walked to the other side of the building where the editor sat, sat, and uh, I just walked right into her office and said, you made this note. I don't agree with you. And I don't remember what she said, (laughs) but I do remember leaving. And then later that day, my boss called me into her office and said, don't ever do that again. Oh my God. If you're a design assistant or, you know, just talk to your boss first, talk to the art director first. I mean, there were times where you guys would come into my office, like you would, you would come in hot, not you especially, (laughs) but you know, you know, the folks, you know, your teammates, um, Mm -hmm. your old teammates would come in super hot. (laughs) Can you believe what X, Y, and Z editor said about my cover? I was like, you know, it's when we're talking about the design of a book, 90% of the design choices of any given children's book in our group are yours. Those are, those are your decisions mm-hmm. and yours alone. The rest of it, the remaining 10% is going to be cut up between the publisher and the editor and, and uh, let them have that 10% because you have the 90%. And that's, that's how I approached 
That's what, like thinking of it that way helped me not get so bent out of shape. Anytime mm-hmm. someone who wasn't quote an artist or, you know, art educated made an art comment. That in, like entire learning curve was definitely, I would assume that most, uh, a thing that most designers just struggle with their whole career. Yeah. Um, because because there are a lot of opinions. And I mean, I also like try to remind myself that when an editor specifically or, or anyone who's not on the design team has an opinion about how a book should look, mm-hmm. even if I disagree with it, um, that they have that opinion because they, they care about it. And the alternative is that they just sign off on it and like say whatever. And like they, they don't care about the project. But I, I think sometimes it gets more frustrating when someone is really invested in a project because they have a lot of, they just have like have a vision for it and they want it to be the best it can be. And that I try to remind myself that like that attitude is so sweet and helpful and like nice to be around people who are passionate about the thing Mm -hmm. that they're working on, even when that results in changes that I don't agree with or like conversations that are, um, frustrating. Yeah. A hundred percent. It's so much better than having an editor who doesn't care. Yeah. Yeah. The best is an editor who trusts you a lot and will give you a few good ideas and then let you do your thing. And I think that also holds true for illustrators and designers is to like give, I like to, I honestly really like to give illustrators like a little bit of structure and then hire people who I know just like them doing their own thing Mm -hmm. is going to make a really great end result. So I don't know. I really like when I can give people prompts that are like, oh yeah, we want X, Y, Z on the cover. But like, other than that, do whatever. Yep. Um, that actually segues to the next thing I want to do. I mean, I, as much as I would love to, uh, walk down memory lane with you, <laughs> uh, let's remember who's listening in. Uh, yes. and I asked the newsletter subscribers of, of the illustration department to, provide some questions. We had done this once before with Jim Hoover, who, you know, Mm -hmm. art director over at Viking, your old colleague. And Mm -hmm. um, it went, went really, really well. So why not do it again? So we're doing it again. Yeah. And here's what I'm excited about. Some of these questions are repeats, more or less uh, of questions that Jim answered. And Mm -hmm. if anyone has already listened to the Jim's Q and a, and then they'll listen to your Q and a, they may hear different answers to the same question, which is important to point out because so much of this is subjective as heck. So much of it is. And so I think I always say to illustrators who go through the school, you know, ask as many questions to as many people as you can because you will be getting conflicting answers. Some answers will overlap. And when you see those overlaps, then you, there might be something there. Um, but anyway, so let's do a little Q&A. Are you ready? Yeah, sounds good. All right. And like last time, I'll give you their name and where they're from and their question. Um, I collected these questions, I sort of organized them and gave them themes this time. Here are the themes. The first one is how do I find and how do you find an illustrator? Second mm-hmm. one is postcards. So many questions about postcards. So okay. many. So many. Uh, the next grouping is process. The next group is trends. Mm-hmm. And then we have a few miscellaneous. Toward okay. The end. All right. So here we go. Let's go. So Farah from the United Kingdom asks, as an art director, how do you choose an illustrator for an upcoming project? Oh, man. So I haven't, I, I can't remember if we've put this in the recording at this point, but I recently changed positions. So the, from one publishing house to another. Um, and I think the process is a little bit different depending on where you work in terms of actual process for hiring someone. Um, for me, I like to have a sense of what the book's about. I like to talk to the editor um, and get an idea of what they're expecting. Obviously, I'll take into account the a- the intended a- audience for the book, the age range. I'll just like dig through 
probably at this point hundreds of illustrators and sort of try to look at someone whose work reminds me of the feeling of the concept of the book, which sounds very abstract, but sort of clicks um, when it comes into place. And then I'll, I'll also, like on top of that, be thinking about like, oh, do we want it to feel younger or older? Like, how do they draw kids at this age? How do they draw characters at this age? Do they draw, like, does this book have a lot of animals? Do they draw a lot of animals? Um, do they have of examples of like all the components that we want in this book in their portfolio in terms of like if there's going to be a lot of environments are they drawing a lot of environments um if there's going to be black and white illustrations do they have black and white art in their portfolio and then um the actual selection process i assume varies from publishing house to publishing house so then you sort of go through the the process where you run the artists that you've picked by the other folks on the team who have to approve it and then reach out Mm -hmm. That leads me to this question. So Mary from Nashville asks, uh, so Mary teaches a portfolio class, a senior level portfolio class, and she asked her students to provide a question. Uh, And they came back with, if you're trying to pick between 10 different illustrators for a project, what would you look for first in their portfolio and what would you look for last? Ooh, this is a good one. Yeah. I mean, it definitely depends on the project. So a good fit for the project is probably the first thing. I guess style comes into that a lot because if it's like a book about princesses or whatever and it's going to be the tone of the book is like very light and fluffy and innocent then you want someone whose work encompasses all of those things. Whereas if it's like a moody retelling of a fairy tale, um, that's a totally different different art style in my mind. Mm -hmm. So good fit for the project is number one. I would say close second without saying like a specific, if there's not a specific prompt is consistency in the portfolio because I want to make sure when I'm looking at artist portfolios that they don't just have, they don't just have like one good good drawing of a person they've got like a bunch Mm -hmm. or one good drawing of an animal or one good drawing of a background or whatever the primary focus of the book is um because I I mean I'm also an illustrator so I know sometimes you draw something really well once (laughs) and you just cannot make it happen again Um, did I do that yeah, it's like, oh, wow, that's like my, I don't know where that came from. I was mm-hmm. possessed by a muse. Um, it's not, it's great for personal work. It's not great when you need someone to draw the same thing over and over again. Mm-hmm. So that is a thing that I pay really close attention to when I'm looking at portfolios. Okay. What would I look at last? Yeah, last. What is least important to me? I'm trying to think like what are things that people get told a lot about portfolios that are least important to me. I think having different styles represented in your portfolio is not important to me. I'd rather see consistency within one. Ooh. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I feel like that's a note sometimes people are given, <laughs> um, I think to try to make their, their portfolio really appealing to a wide range. But if you're like not interested in a specific style and you're just forcing yourself to do all of these different things instead of exploring the stuff that you're really interested in. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it can make your portfolio look really disjointed. And then it's also often obvious, like which styles you're having the most fun working in. Um, and you should just work in those. (laughs) Um, I'm glad to hear you say that because I completely disagree, but that's okay. Totally. Yeah. I'm not saying I definitely, I would, I loved seeing different styles. Um, I still love seeing different styles and I encourage illustrators who come through the school if they want to work in different styles to, to do so, but it isn't right or wrong. It is one of those things where it's just, if that is, if your natural expression is one style then do that, if it's three, then do that. Yeah. Um, And if you're excited about it, you should absolutely work in different styles and like explore those and figure out what's the most interesting. I just think sometimes I've seen it in college students. It feels very forced. Like someone has been told they must draw in, they must use like wa- do watercolor illustrations of children if they ever want to get hired, but they're like so obviously not interested in it. Yep. 
I don't know. I'd rather see work that is like exciting and obviously the person was invested in and whether that means that it's all in one style or in separate styles. And I've also, I guess I've also had design comments from people that are like, but what if we want this person to draw this way? And it's like, well, then hire a different person. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let's move on. Oh, one of the, you know, I'd have to say, um, one of the things I would have looked for last is age. Oh, yeah. How many illustrators, this is my question. Um, I'm bumping the, bumping the line here. How many okay. illustrator portfolios do you look at? Um, how many of them have photographs of the illustrator and how many of them do not we were doing stuff at penguin um before i left where i was sometimes intentionally looking for illustrators from specific demographics mm -hmm. and that is the only time i remember being actually frustrated at the lack of photos slash about me pages like yeah. there are a couple of uh agencies and um like websites that host lots of portfolios. I can't think of the name, like directories um, mm -hmm. that track that information that are useful for things like that. I think, I don't actually think very many people put photos on their sites. No, they should. I though. feel like I see a lot more drawings of people like mm -hmm. self portraits mm -hmm. um, or nothing. Mm -hmm. And then once in a while, a photo. Yeah. I mean, my suggestion is always, if you're going to be a professional illustrator, get a professional headshot. <laughs> do you do you know what my photo is on my website? A selfie? No. <laughs> oh wait, is it the, is it the one where it's like a baby drinking a Pepsi Cola bottle or something? <laughs> it's, it's me as a one year one or two year old holding a giant bottle of Mountain Dew. Oh, I remember that. <laughs> it's extremely professional. That's, a, that, no, that's actually excellent. Or that, or you know, do, get a professional headshot or show. a baby drinking soda <laughs> or do you call it pop because you're from pittsburgh i call it pop because i'm from pittsburgh <laughs> i'm surprised you knew that one actually well sarah uh went to university of pittsburgh oh well then i'm not surprised you knew it yep uh rubber bands or gum bands that one never really stuck with me but i've heard it yeah uh do you say yins I have relatives who do. Okay. I don't. I somehow started doing y'all more, which I don't know where that came from. <laughs> but <laughs> um, Okay. The next question comes from several different sources. So Deborah from Leesburg, Virginia. Um, Aldo from El, pa El Paso. There's a few others who basically ask the same question, and it is this. How would a new illustrator best connect with you? There's lots of different ways. I mean, with social media and Twitter and the internet, um, it becomes so wildly random <laughs> um, with how you come across people's work. So I think things that I'll, I'll focus a little bit on, like things that increase your chances of uh, an art director or a designer coming across your work. Postcards are actually still really effective because I look at all of them even more than I would look at emails, I will delete portfolio emails because my inbox is full of work that needs to actually be done immediately. And I usually can't keep track of the portfolio ones. So postcards, surprisingly effective, even in 2019. I think agents and agencies are not a thing that you need to have. I feel like people ask that all the time. Um, I definitely hire illustrators without agents. You do not need one. However, if you are on an agency site, um, I do think more designers are going to come across your work more regularly because your agent is doing the work of putting you out there. And also, it's really easy to go to an agency site and be like, well, we know that all of these people are at least in the wheelhouse of children's books um, and just flip through that as opposed to going on like Twitter or something and trying to curate out of like literally millions of people mm -hmm. and hundreds of thousands of artists, like anyone who is anywhere close to the right fit for the project, like at least an agency is a little bit narrowed down. Um, also like directories, like I mentioned before, um, like I, I think women who draw is one that I use a lot. I think that's the name of it. There's a couple of other that are focused towards specifically 
like people of color and stuff like that. Um, if those apply to you, like absolutely get on those directories because they're, um, useful. I use them. Um, they're, they're not curated really, but it's, um, good to have a starting point. Mm -hmm. Uh, you basically answered, uh, Caitlin from upstate New York. You answered her (laughs) question. Uh, do you need an agent basically? Or do you work with illustrators who don't have agents? Uh, yes. You answered Farah's question. She's from the UK. Is it still worthwhile to send out promotional uh, <laughs> details to art directors? You answered Christine's question. From, she's from Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, what do you look for in a postcard? But she adds, so let's, let's go here next. Um, should we send multiple and what size? Oh, I feel like, uh, send multiple. Yes. I would say continue to send them. Um, especially if it is a place that you're really interested in working, um, or at an imprint you're really interested in working with. And I don't think you need to do it like every month, but like every four months, maybe, Mm -hmm. um, a couple of times a year. Um, as long as you're still interested in, in the work that that place is putting out, Mm -hmm. And for size, I mean, I don't think size matters. I wouldn't go uh, obnoxious in either direction. <laughs> um, but like, you know, the, the mailboxes are, they're big. You can, you can put a lot in there. Uh, uh-huh. um, yeah, like five by seven is, is, is fine, you know. Yeah. You don't, I mean, you don't, you surely do not have to get fancy. No. Uh, the weirdest quote mailing that i ever got in 20 years in publishing was a rock (laughs) i got a rock do you remember this were you yeah did i I ever show it to you don't know if i remember this on it was painted a dinosaur and i do remember this (laughs) the i have it it's i have it in one of my boxes here um it is uh because i I couldn't i couldn't and then maybe this is a successful mailer because i never threw it away um, but anyways, did on you the, hire them though? No, I didn't hire them. <laughs> so but maybe on, not a successful mail. Yeah. It was painted like a white, uh, line piece of line art of a dinosaur, their phone number and their email address. And I think maybe their website on the rock. Mm, I don't want to encourage people to do this. Please don't send <laughs> us rocks. This is very funny. Yeah. Don't do that. <laughs> um, I got a piece of wood once. I re- I remember that. Did Betsy take those or were they sent to her? I, I remember us I like remember. delightedly cackling over several illustrations that had been burned into pieces of wood. That's right. That's what they were. I mean, they were cool. And that's the thing. It's like, I get it, man. It's, it's, you're trying to stand up from the crowd and it's cool to like make anything period. It doesn't matter if it's a rock with a dinosaur or a piece of wood. It's, it's always a it's always better to make something than to not make something. So regardless of its Mm -hmm. quality or whatever. Um, But I can just, I mean, the cost of mailing those (laughs) things probably, they probably didn't send it to just me either. I mean, they sent it to a bunch of folks that probably cost them a lot of money. So I think just postcards, man, just stick with postcards. It's cheaper. Yeah. And it's hard to, I mean, we, we touched on this a little bit, but like, the designer that you're sending the mailers to is not the only person making the illustrator hiring decision. Like we have to get it approved by other folks and it is really hard to translate a painting on a rock to a children's book or to make that pitch to anyone. Even if it was like a beautiful painting, um, that's a hard pitch to make. (laughs) That's a good point. Elise from St. George, Utah, which by the way, side note, is a gorgeous, gorgeous part of Utah. Um, it's in South Utah, and it's just, I've been there once, and it's um, unbelievably beautiful. So anytime, mm-hmm. if anyone's in striking distance of St. George, Utah, you should visit it. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, Elise asks, besides postcards, what other, quote, cold call type methods are effective for reaching art directors? Mm, I'm trying to think, because I think, like, I mentioned this briefly, but I know some people will cold email. Um, those do tend to disappear into my inbox because yeah. like most designers are getting 20 or 30, if not more emails a day for like 
urgent to do for their day to day at work. And it's, yeah. it's hard to sift portfolio emails out of that or to like spend any time with them. That's why I like postcards so much because it, yeah. it forced you to turn away from your computer. Also, you can keep them. I have a manila folder that probably weighs like three pounds <laughs> with basically every postcard I've ever liked um, mm -hmm. that I've gotten in it. And I do flip through that every time I have to hire an illustrator. It's mm -hmm. the first thing I look at, which means that there are illustrators in there who I've literally wanted to work with for four or five years. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm still holding on to them. So they're, they're there. They're in my Rolodex. Once in a while, I will pull one out and be like, it is time. It's been four years and I can finally hire this person. <laughs> yep. um, and sometimes it works out, which is amazing. Yeah. I mean, I, there was a, um, an illustrator that I, it's not necessarily a postcard, but an illustrator that I met um, at an SEBWI event in 2013. And uh, I met her through a portfolio review. And three years later, I hired her to do um, a picture book. Because I remembered her, she was amazing, and I just didn't have anything that was quite right, mm -hmm. you know, for her. But in 2016, I did and contacted her and hired her. That was three years. We're shifting to the next sort of like topic, which is process. Mm -hmm. Tyler from Washington, D.C. asks, how many illustrators do you work with each year? How many of them are new to you? Per year, I think probably I was hiring like 10 to 15 new illustrators, mm -hmm. which when you think about it, it seems like such a small number. But, but that's just you and we were a team of nine. Yeah. 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 Do you think we were hiring 100 illustrators a year? We were working on 175 to 200 books a year. Um, some of them were like pickups. Some of them were repeats, meaning like we were we already had an illustrator, you know, it was like part of a series or something. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I think a hundred to 125 mm -hmm. illustrators were being hired by us a year. Yeah. I'd maybe skew it a little bit lower. Lower than that? Yeah. I feel like we were probably doing that many illustrated books, but like you were saying, some of them were probably pickups or repeats like in series. Yeah. All right. Yeah, maybe maybe like seventy five to one hundred. Okay. Um, and I'm sure that like every year of those ten to twenty were people who were working on their first project. We did hire a lot of people who were doing their first publishing yeah. work. I I when I was hiring, I remember for like my own books. Um, I one of the things going back to one of the questions like what what was one of the first things you look for and one of the last things, I tried to look for illustrators who were not 10 years in with a oh, high yeah. profile representative, you know, I was looking for folks who were just starting out mm -hmm. and because a, it was fun mm -hmm. to work with someone just starting out and B it's, it was just, an, it was just nice to do, you know, yeah. it, it was just a nice thing to do. Just hire somebody who's trying to get into this thing and um and work with them on a project it was it was a wonderful experience yeah that is there's something like really really nice yeah. about that i won't name names but there's an illustrator now who's you know he's very big <laughs> very big and he worked he did something for us he did a reader and i won't again say his name but it might have been one of his first books if not his first book I'm going to have to ask you who this is when we're not recording. Right. <laughs> and now he's, now he's a huge deal. So let's like, I mean, I have a bunch of questions, so many questions, but we don't have all the time in the world here. So let's transition out to the next topic. And that is mistakes. And a number of illustrators actually ask pretty much the same question when, so Scott from Louisville, Kentucky, asked, uh, when she's working with an illustrator, when you are working with an illustrator for the first time, is there anything you find yourself repeating? Uh, Sherry from Beaumont, Texas asked mistakes of first time kid lit illustrators. Uh, there's a few others. So mistakes, what are some mistakes that you see illustrators make? This is, I feel like people are 
probably expecting this to be a question about the actual or to be an answer about the actual illustration work. I will say the most frustrating thing, and I feel like this is a thing that is very obviously due to inexperience, is lack of communication. Oh my God, will make me totally bonkers. Um, If, if it like your deadline is coming up, it looks like you're not going to make it or you're nervous about making it, email your designer, Mm -hmm. tell them, (laughs) please, please just tell them that you're probably going to be late. That is so, so much less bad than just going radio silent and suddenly no one can get a hold of you. And you're, I'm like checking people's Twitters to make sure they haven't been in a horrible accident. And that's why they're not answering my emails. Um, Oh, what's worse is they're not uh, getting back (laughs) to you and you check their Twitter and they tweeted five minutes ago. Yeah, people are always doing that. We see you. We see you not answering our yes. emails and then goofing around on Twitter. Oh, I hated that. God, oh, man. I hated it. It's so bad. Um, so, like, not, I mean, and also not only for missing deadlines and stuff like that, but also for just like asking questions. Like, if you don't understand something about the setup, if you're unclear about the deadlines, if the designer isn't getting back to you, like, if you haven't gotten your notes back and it's like really crunching your, um, revision time or something like that, like email and ask just like a polite professional email check in, uh, anytime you have a question, anytime you're worried about something, if you like feel strongly about something, like you don't need to like get in a fight with your designer or anything like that. But like a question or an explanation, sent professionally is like super welcome. And so many people are so afraid yep. to do that. Yep. It, it um, cures most ills, just simple yes. emailing uh, and just asking a question or even just saying, can I have more time? Cause usually the answer is yeah, you can. Yeah. The answer is almost always yes. Especially if you ask early enough. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas if you just go radio silent for two weeks and then suddenly deliver everything, your designer has been freaking out for those entire two weeks. Yep. And also the whole, the whole imprint has been freaking out because right. it will just go up the chain and then they don't want to work with you anymore <laughs> mm-hmm. um, if you do that. So being afraid to ask questions or communicate with your designer, I think is like the biggest rookie mistake that I see. And everyone does it. I know it's stressful to email an employer, but really it's it's fine. We're people. We understand. Exactly. Yeah, and and the one thing too is to think about when you're when you're um, uh, not emailing your designer back on due dates or things that are due, is that designer is going into a corporate meeting once a week or once every other week with their management, and people, someone is asking them point blank in a room full of twenty twenty five people of their of you know that person's teammates, where is the art? Where are the sketches? They were due yesterday. They were due last week. And so you're putting your designer in this in the hot seat. And it's, you know, just not fair. So even just emailing like, I'm, I know the sketches were due on Friday. I'm so sorry. I need the weekend. Or I'm so sorry. I need another week. That is so welcome. Yeah. And especially if you can see it coming. Like if you're like, oh, man, it's Monday. My stuff's due on Thursday and I can just like tell that it's not going to happen. Just email as soon as you realize and be like, Hey, sorry, life has happened. Um, one of the know. funnier, uh, experiences I had, uh, when working with an illustrator is I would set a date, let's say, uh, sketches are due on Friday and I had sent them a PDF with the galley. Like here's the you know, blank pages with text in place, feel free to move the text around, but use this as a template for your sketches. And then like two days before the due date. And by the way, I sent that PDF to them like four to six weeks (laughs) before the due date Uh, for the sketches, even more than that. And then like that week that the sketches were due, they would email me and say, Hey, can you resend the PDF? Yeah. Don't do that. Don't do that either. Oh, wait. I actually have another pet peeve while we're at. (laughs) I (laughs) knew you would. I knew you would. What's up? I I feel like I have to get better about explaining this when I send stuff to illustrators. So this is partially on me. But if a designer sends you a template, do not turn in the art flattened to the template. 
please, I know. please just, just a JPEG without the template on it or a layered PSD file or a layered anything file that you can turn off the template layer or just draw it inside the template, remove the template before you export the JPEG and send it to the designer. Yep. It was please. such a beautiful gift when someone sent you a layered file and the first layer, the top layer was your template. Uh, it is. It's wonderful. Oh, God, it was great. Just turn it off. <laughs> it's so easy to make us happy. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, all right. One more mistake, or should we move on to the last topic? I feel like I had one, and then I immediately forgot it. Oh, uh, this is really little. Um, just just num- if you're turning in a whole bunch of files, like you've done a whole interior for a book not just a cover just like number them in some semblance of order yeah um just in the order that they go in the book ideally or by the page number no other crazy naming conventions don't name them by the topic of the illustration that doesn't help me at all (laughs) yep or like don't name them you know revised updated a s d f g h underscore v2 like that doesn't help anybody When in doubt, I always liked their, I always liked the project name. Mm -hmm. So book title underscore page number dot whatever, TIFF, EPS, JPEG. That was always my favorite way of of organizing files for a lot of reasons. One is it just makes a lot of sense and it it makes it easier for the designer to lay in the art. Mm Because like you said, you know, page one, there it is. Page two, there it is. Um, and two, it's easier to search for those files, especially mm-hmm. when some designers are just messier than others. And if they have a messy desktop and let's say they're out that day, but the files have to route <laughs> internally, then you just do a search like, oh my God, where is their file? Search by the book title, search by the page number, and it's there. And that happened a lot. You know, it, and you know, I mean, it happens like if you're sick, usually it's like the day you're out sick is the day that those files have to route to yeah, copy always. editing or, you know, God forbid, I have a bunch of mistakes too, but we have, we're, we're short on time. We have trends and then last thoughts. So a bunch of folks uh, posted questions about trends. So Josh from Colorado, Colorado Springs asked, are you seeing any interesting trends? Um, Talitha from Fort Wayne asked um about trends she went one further and talked about or asked about like how do you incorporate color palettes or subject matter to sort of stay with stay marketable while also maintaining your own style uh katie cordesh from la asks thoughts on illustration trends let's kind of like like Talitha really, she, she touches on a couple interesting points. So she, her full question is, how would you suggest an illustrator balance staying on trend with a marketable portfolio while staying true to their own unique style? So that's a heavy question. Oh boy. Yeah. Are there certain ways to incorporate color palettes or subject matter to achieve this? Also, what trends do you see right now in picture book illustration? So you don't have to answer like every one of those questions bit by bit, just for sake of time generally if you are making illustrations that you're excited about and you know like as an artist you're going to be absorbing influences from all sorts of things in your life all of that stuff i my personal belief is that all of that stuff sort of ferments in everyone's brains um and especially the stuff that they like um and then sort of comes back out in your your artwork Mm -hmm. So honestly, just by experiencing things that you like, you're sort of like feeding that input. The thing about trends, like I don't, I'm not a big fan of the the word. I'm not a big fan of chasing trends because a lot of times like folks that I talk to when we talk about trends usually cite, they'll usually say something to the effect like, oh, I went to the bookstore you know, my local bookstore and I went to the children's book section and I saw a bunch of books and now I know what the trend is, which is wrong. That is one bookstore. <laughs> that is, uh, there's one buyer that's rep- that, you know, sort of sells in that buys those books. There's one, probably one sales 
representative within that area. And it's that sales representatives at their discretion, they sell, they'll choose which books to sell to the buyer. And like it gets filtered and filtered and filtered and filtered and filtered and filtered before it even gets onto the shelf of that independent bookstore in some town, some state to go into a bookstore and peruse the shelves for a few minutes and then go, I know what the trends are is just folly. Also, it takes so long for books to come out that all those books that you just looked at in the bookstore, even if they just came out, were made almost a year ago. Yeah, or <laughs> years means, ago. Uh-huh. Yeah, that you are a year behind in the trend. <laughs> I think I, just for simplicity's sake, uh, just draw what's interesting to you. Yes. And do it well. <laughs> if you do that, you, sh- you won't have to worry about trends. All right, so... I mean, we have like, I, we, I, we, you answered about half of the questions that I was uh, supplied. So Uh-oh. sorry, guys. That's all right. We, we try to get them all in there, but you know, more or less, we, we got the, the bigger points. I like to end um, my conversations uh, on a little bit of a, you know, tangible high note, so to speak. So remembering <laughs> that sitting with you and me um, at a bar, ideally <laughs> is uh is an illustrator who's you know trying to break in trying to get some information trying to you know just make their way and make sense of of a lot of the confusion and uh convoluted rules and processes that the children's book industry weirdly uh puts in front of them so what would be one piece of advice that you would like to share with them so i had a teacher in school who was not a teacher who I particularly got along with in many ways. Um, but he did give a piece of advice that I think about a lot and I think was really, really good. And it was just make work that you would want to hang on your wall. Um, and I think that is just like such a good way of thinking about it because like we've said this a couple times throughout this conversation now that people should just make work that they're excited about and interested in And like, if you think it would be really cool to have a giant poster hung up in your room of, you know, whatever X, Y, Z, and like to have it all in like these specific colors, like you should make that piece of art and hang it up. And because you were excited about it, it's almost certainly going to be better than if you sat and thought a lot about trends and like made something that you thought was like a trendy children's book illustration. Um, Get excited about things and also pull influences from places that you wouldn't expect. Mm -hmm. Is that that too mysterious? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Let's leave it mysterious and uh, which is, which is par for the course for contemporary children's publishing. (laughs) Mysterious indeed. (laughs) Mysterious indeed. To learn more about Kayla, visit KaylaWassel.com. If you enjoyed our conversation, please share it online, subscribe to the podcast, and leave us a positive rating and review. This helps us find new listeners, and on a personal note, it would be nice to know that the podcast is helping. Continue the conversation in the comments section of each episode at illustrationdepartment.com forward slash podcast. This podcast is produced by the Illustration Department, a global leader in online education for illustrators. Visit us at illustrationdept.com for class offerings, testimonials, the alumni showcase, and more. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.